In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. This is the word of the Lord that came to me, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. My brothers and sisters, we are here, though drenched in the blood of Cain's ancient question, his words echoing through all the corridors of time like a gunshot in the night. Am I my brother's keeper? Or maybe we should phrase it this way, are we our brother's keepers? It's a question that cuts through to flesh and bone, exposing the raw nerve of our nature especially in the realization that at every opportunity we have taken our Lord's gifts for granted. We strut upon this sacred earth, exploiting one another with cunning smiles and calculated schemes under disguise of what's lawful and what we say is right and wrong. Our desires morph into obsessions and we dare to murder not just in the flesh, but the very life of fellowship and brotherhood the very community that God has given us, our congregation. Even here, hungrily seizing for our selfish purposes what God has not given to us. When someone is hurt or harmed by our choices, we have the audacity dripping on our lips to cry out to God like Cain, how is this my problem? But remember when the mighty floodwaters swallowed the wickedness of old, And yet we, the new progeny of Noah, tread down the same path. In the same way, the Tower of Babel stands as a testament against our arrogance, too. As as they sought to pierce the heavens themselves, so do we, to storm heaven by force, to declare what we think is righteous, good, and true. But what did God do with those floodwaters or to those who built the tower? Our language was twisted, our unity was scattered, and God scattered us to the winds. It was our fault. But what did we learn? Do we not still try to build up our own towers today, again, constructed from the bricks of our own pride and the mortar of our self-indulgence? So we aren't all that different from those that we meet in the scriptures. They are our brothers and sisters, too. Like the serpent in Eden's garden, we echo those half-truths, hissing them into the ears of our brothers and sisters, sowing discord and conflict, shattering trust. We shun our Lord's divine commands. We sculpt our own golden calves from our desires. And then we smirk, too, and turn around to the Creator and demand, why have you forsaken us? We are so arrogant, petulant, and pitiful, like rebellious children. The ground beneath our feet trembles, and the earth itself bears witness to our insolent rebellion. And yet, how do we react? We dance with the devil and then wail when the flames lick at our heels. And that gets to the heart of the matter. We are the architects of our own misfortune, the builders of our own personal hells. We revel in our excess. We gorge on what God has forbidden, those fruits. Or to say it this way, we shun God's word and his gifts, prioritizing our own wants, our own things over others' needs. We look the other way when someone is weak and fallen, saying, well, how sad, how tragic, or how disgusting. But when the final reckoning arrives and God's furious anger breathes upon us, withering our spirits, afflicting our bodies, our lives, even the things that we have been trying to build, then we cry foul, how could God forsake us? And point our fingers up to the heavens, demanding that God apologize to us for what he has done to us. Don't believe me? How about this? Listen, maybe you've heard these sorts of things. Our church closed because we couldn't pay the bills. We didn't support the pastor and his family or the teachers. We didn't show up to worship when our brothers and sisters because we had better things to do. But oh, why has God forsaken us? Why do our family and friends, especially our congregation, turn away from us? They don't call, they don't text, they treat us coldly at family parties. How could God allow this? 
We become weak and fall, and there's no one to pick us up. We ask for help, and no one answers our pleas. Well, God damn them for not helping me when we cry. And so we're like Abel, with his blood crying out from the ground, a haunting refrain that echoes also through the corridors of time. Are we our brother's keepers? And the answer, my friends, is etched in our own deeds. We answer that rhetorical question with our choices and by our very souls. Cain's question demands a reckoning, an answer, a grappling with the reality of our own humanity like fallen Cain. We, the prodigal sons and daughters, must stare deep into the mirror of our own actions, cast aside our arrogance and embrace the divine mandate to love one another, to show charity. Because in the end, as the dust settles and the smoke clears, the truth remains. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, because Jesus suffered, died, and was raised from the dead to redeem you, his brothers and sisters. So if they are worth God's life, if he died for them, if he kept them safe from sin, death, and hell, then they're worth your sacrificing for too. But are any of you ready and willing to do this, to be your brother's keeper? Let, let me give you a hypothetical and see how this will work out based off of past experience. If, for example, you are ordered to stay home because of another virus outbreak, let's say in December, just in time for Christmas, will you comply? Knowing what you know now, three years later, Will you forsake your church and your fellow brothers and sisters here who need to hear your songs and prayers and thanksgiving, especially as we celebrate together the birth of Jesus, the one who actually gives life over death? Or when the demand comes, it will be enough of an excuse for you to turn away from family and friends, to treat them as potential virus spreaders, potential killers. Will you isolate yourself from your brothers and sisters to make yourself feel safe? That might be a good time to ask the question again, am I my brother's keeper? And if, you, if not you, then who is? If Christians can't even do this, even though we have a clear mandate from God, who will? Who will be my brother's keeper? Who will protect me and my family from you who forsake me? Who will defend this church and preserve the preaching of the gospel and administration of the sacraments here, even in a time of crisis? Who will bend down and pick up your brother and sister when they're weak and fallen, even when they make a tragic mistake? It must be Jesus, and Jesus actually who keeps us, defends us, and protects us. We are his brother, and he never fails us. And of course, God must do this because we lack the faith, courage, and strength to do it. And if not Jesus, then who else will rescue us from Cain's fate? Who else can put a mark on our forehead, a sign of the Holy Cross, to save us from death? There's no one else coming to help us because we already stand in the aftermath of our own handiwork, unwilling and unable to take responsible for all the ways we've sinned against our brothers and sisters. Every man, woman on earth, including us, stands on this ground, scarred by our recklessness and cowardice. Cities of vanity rise like monuments to our fleeting desires, and the cries of those desperate in need are drowned out by the cacophony of, well, what we think we want, our excess. Knowing no one else is coming to help us because we've all grown skilled at evading responsibility and crafting excuses to absolve ourselves from staring at the consequences of our own actions in the thorny crowned face of Jesus. So the words of Eden's rebellion still spill out of our mouths day after day. A confession of sin about the choices we've made and the paths we've taken that take us farther and farther away from God. And yet, then when God meets out his divine justice against us with thunderclouds and lightning, we dive for cover. We dare to shake our fists at the sky proclaiming, why, O oh God, have you forsaken us? 
rather than acknowledging it's our own damn fault. So ask yourself, what if God adopted the same attitude? What if God's answer to us was, why have I forsaken you? I don't know, am I your keeper? Should I treat you the way you treat your own brothers and sisters? Do I abandon you the way that you've abandoned me? Imagine that. Imagine if that's the sort of God we had. Our churches would be even emptier than they are, already are. But again, here's the revelation of Calvary's cross and the only anecdote for our rebellion to what God has given. God never abandons or forsakes us. He remains amidst the struggles and chaos of our own making, amidst the debris of our shattered promises, he comes and over and over calls us to repentance, shows us our sins, to forgive those sins and to lead us again into the way of life and eternity. As we flip through the pages of the scriptures, maybe Gospel of Mark would be a good one. There's a beacon of truth that emerges. Jesus responds to Cain and to all of us by declaring us his kin when we put our trust in him. He says to us, you are my brothers and sisters. That's God's answer to Cain's lingering query. Yes, you are your brother's keeper because I am yours. I will be your guardian, your keeper, and your brethren too. Because what seems insurmountable for you is well within my grasp. I can even make children of Abraham out of these stones, he says. So, brothers and sisters, as we consider the audacity of Cain's question, am I my brother's keeper? We are simultaneously grasped by the unfailing truth that in the arms of our Savior Jesus, we find the answers we, we so desperately need. No longer do we cry out, why have you forsaken us? Instead, we are embraced by the unyielding, resounding affirmation that we are not forsaken, that we are indeed our brother's keeper through the boundless love of Jesus Christ. And unlike how you treat me, and I treat you, and we treat one another, God does not desert us in our hour of need. So as we strut and stumble through life, and we are called to pay attention to the fact that our brothers and sisters aren't there for us to exploit, to misuse, to ignore, or to leave for dead. They are instruments of God's grace and mercy. Through their struggles and sacrifices, God is at work in us to create and redeem life for them, to forge strength for them in adversity, and to give us objects for whom we can love. So when you look into your brothers and sisters' eyes, be it here among the household of faith or even in your own family or in this world, remember that you are gazing into the face of God himself. Because you are seeing someone for whom Jesus triumphed over death. Someone whom Jesus loves and has saved. You are seeing someone who needs a brother to help them climb out of the ditch into which they've fallen. The person in front of you is a mirror God holds up to you to reveal, this one, this brother, is an embodiment of my redemption song of victory. Love him as I have loved you. Sacrifice for him as I have sacrificed my life to redeem you. This is why I've created you. This is the Christian mission. And this is why I call you my brothers and sisters, that you may love each other as I have loved you. This is the word of the Lord that came to me so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name alone. Amen.